So um, I have introduced Jeff in his absence, but this is uh, Dr. Jeff Holst, and he's a medical scientist, works out of the Centenary Institute in RPA, and uh, he is, I'm pleased to say, a uh, PCFA recipient of a research grant, and uh, we love the work he does. Um, so thanks very much for the opportunity to come and talk to you today. Um, so yeah, as David has said, I'm at uh, Centenary Institute, and I'm a, a research scientist. I'm not a medical doctor, but I'm a PhD uh, and trained uh, in doing sort of bench lab science. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is the work we're doing, which is trying to work out a link between nutrition and prostate cancer. So something that's quite an interesting topic, but instead of talking to you about diet and things you can do, what we're trying to look at is what's happening inside the actual prostate cancer cell and trying to work out what's happening. Because, you know, as we know with men, if we try and change our diet, you know, probably not going to be successful. Uh, you know, we all love our meat and our dairy and, and things like that. Um, and for prostate cancer, it's such a, a long-term disease. For you to know an effect of a diet, it's going to take 30 years. So what we want to try and do is find out what's going on inside the cells and then find if our, out if there's another way that we can attack that with a drug or something to try and block these nutrient pathways in prostate cancer. So I'm going to take you through that very briefly uh, today over the next 15 minutes. And I like to keep it really informal. So if you've got a question, if I say a technical word, just say, Jeff, what are you talking about? Uh, and I'm happy to explain it. Sometimes we get caught up with our jargon. You know, I'm so used to explaining this to a scientific community. So I've tried to uh, put it in lay terms, but if there's anything you don't understand, there's no such thing as a silly question. Just pull me up and I'll try and explain it a little bit better to you. So just a little bit about me. Um, I started off my training at the University of Technology in Sydney. Uh, then I did a PhD at the University of New South Wales. And all of my early work was on immunology. So I was studying asthma and allergy. And then when I moved to the US for three and a half years, I was working on autoimmunity at that time. But um, like all of you here, you've been touched by prostate cancer, either personally or someone in your family. Um, my grandfather died of prostate cancer. Uh, my auntie died of breast cancer uh, quite young. So these are things that have always been on my heart, something that I wanted to actually research. So I moved away from immunology when I came back to Australia in 2006. And I spent a couple of years trying to start up my own research group looking at cancer and specifically prostate cancer and also a little bit of breast cancer as well. So in 2008, um, thanks really to Movember and the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia, I managed to start up my own lab looking at how nutrient pumps and prostate cancer work. So uh, I've got a, a great little team, another um, uh, Dr. Kevin Wang, who's a, another postdoc uh, scientist. So he finished his PhD at University of Sydney and I managed to snaffle him up straight away. So he's been with me for the last three and a half years and really uh, has been pioneering everything in the lab. Um, Jessamy is a PhD student who's just finished and Kinsha, the three of them, have been helping me out with these projects that I'm going to talk to you about today. And uh, here's Kevin here. Uh, we had a nice little lawn bowls day. Uh, there's Jessamy there in the front, and Kinsha wasn't in the group. Uh, so we like to have a bit of fun as well, mix it in with our serious science. Um, Which bowling club? Uh, that one there is Camperdown. Yeah. So it's, we're just around the corner from us, so we could walk down there after work. So uh, where are we doing this research? So the Centenary Institute, um, it's called the Centenary Institute, it was commemorating the 100 year anniversary of the RPA Hospital and the University of Sydney, which you would all know. I, I probably think none of you have heard of the Centenary Institute. We're quite small, there's about 200 researchers there. And we re research a wide variety of different topics, but it's a custom built building uh, for uh, basic science research, but then with a clinical interface and then also all of the resources of the university as well. So I don't really need to labour these points. You know, you're all here because you know about the devastating uh, impact of prostate cancer in Australia. So it's the most common uh, male specific cancer. More than 20,000 new cases a year and almost 3,500 men are now dying every year in Australia. And the thing that has always struck me is, uh, you know, as I said, my auntie died of breast cancer, but there's so much funding in breast cancer. I mean, there could still be more, but prostate cancer has really lagged behind. And uh, 
you know, the awareness and the research funding is, is really lagging behind. So it's great to see all of you here as part of support groups, which, you know, is, is great to be able to get together. That's part of what the Prostate Cancer Foundation is, is really uh, interested in, is, is getting people together. It's the research, the awareness and the support. So we're doing the research side, but it's great to be able to see all of you here today as well. So Movember has made a big difference. Um, this, is, this will be my fifth Mo this year. Um, and uh, I think it goes quite nicely with the tux. Um, so, uh, uh, <laughs> well, well, you know, this happened to be a year I, I won an award at the end of November. And my wife said to me, you, you have to get rid of the moustache. You can't go to an award ceremony with a moustache. But, you know, I think that was a great opportunity to say, well, you know, this is an important cause uh, and you know, we need to, no matter what we're doing, whether we're winning our first ever award or whatever, you know, we're, we're out there with our moustaches raising that awareness um, and raising money as well. So, so that's been great. So also, as you all know, um, ageing is, is the, the biggest sort of risk factor in prostate cancer. So we know that as you get older, uh, you're more and more at risk. But we don't actually know a lot about the other risk factors. So, um, you know, here's some incidence numbers. You can see that the incidence is actually increasing. The number of people dying is also increasing. So these are not good things. We want to see this going the other way. And whereas a few years ago the numbers were equal with breast cancer, you can see now that there's far less breast cancer cases in Australia and the mortality is actually less in Australia as well. So these are the things that research is doing for breast cancer, bringing the numbers down. Whereas for prostate cancer, they're still going up. So we need to really do something about that quite quickly. So what are we doing about that? What uh, is it that we want to understand in our laboratory? Well, we came across some interesting data, which all you need to worry about here is this first number after the name of the, the country or the continent. So China, about two out of 100,000. Africa, 20. Australia, Western Europe, 70, 80, 125 for the USA. So you can see in China, very, very low rates of prostate cancer. Africa, also very low rates of prostate cancer. But in the West, we have very high rates. So there's two things that that could be. One is an environmental influence. The other one is a genetic. You know, we know that we're, we're different genetically. But what some research showed, which is really interesting, is that when Asian or African men migrate to the US, they end up getting prostate cancer at the same rate as American men. And in fact, African Americans get even worse incidence of prostate cancer compared to Caucasian American men. So this suggests it's not, nothing to do with genetics. It's just purely the environment that you're in. Something to do with uh, maybe diet, um, maybe something else. But we think that it quote, could be due to diet. Uh, now, the Western diet is very high in red meat and dairy. Um, Everyone always asks me after these talks, are you, you know, have you sworn off red meat and dairy? No, I still love a good steak. I still love cheese and milk. And uh, you know, it's, it's too early for us in our research to say, well, just because there looks like there's some link to actually do something about it. And as I said, the studies would have to be so long term, it's really hard to work that out. But what we're trying to work on is off this theory that maybe these red meat and, and dairy are actually playing some kind of role. And what we've found is that these, um, these essential amino acids, so the building blocks of proteins are called amino acids. And there's ones that our body can't make. We have to ingest them. And they're at highest levels in red meat and dairy. And what our research has shown is that there's some of these pumps that bring these nutrients, bring these amino acids into the cells that are actually increased in prostate cancer. So you have an increase in the pumps that bring in these nutrients, there's an increase in the nutrients, and these nutrients are actually critical for cell growth. So if you think of a cell just like a body, right? you've got an outside like our skin, and to get nutrients in, we open our mouth, shove food in, chew it up, and eat it. Well, cells, they have a skin on them as well, the outside cell wall. And what they have is these little pumps all over the surface of the cell that are able to open and close and bring these nutrients into and out of the cell. So to be like on a prostate cancer cell, instead of having one mouth, they've got 100 mouths. So all, all of a sudden, they can bring more nutrients in. And we know that just like a teenager, you know, if you've ever, ever had a teenage boy, they eat you out of house and home. Because they're growing so much, they need to eat more food to grow. And it's the same with cancer cells. They need to eat more in order to grow. And we think one of the ways they do that 
is to increase the number of these pumps on the surface, bringing these nutrients into the cell. And that combined with lots and lots of nutrients is a bad thing. So, yeah. The danger with red meat is in the red meat itself, not, not, in, the, not in the fat that's attached to it. Well, there's a lot of different theories on that. And, and it's, as I said, it's really hard uh, just looking at population studies, you know, do some people cut the fat off, do some people not? Is it that you barbecue it and then there's, you know, potential problems there? There's so many different theories on that. What we're trying to get at is to get away from, you know, is it a certain component of food, but what's happening inside the cell and trying to understand that to find out another way to cut that off because I don't want to give up red meat. Uh, you know, I don't want to give up dairy. I'd rather be able to have something else that can stop that because to me that's a fantastic part of life is food. And, you know, I'd, you know, whilst you may or may not affect your prostate cancer incidence, I'd much rather be able to do something to intervene and still be able to enjoy the, the good things in life. Just on the booster on there, and I know you're still researching, are you implying that possibly a person with prostate cancer should eat less? Um, yeah, I, I just I wouldn't say that at this point. Yeah, so def definitely not. And it's not about less, it's, it's also about, uh, you know, there's, there's lots of people out there that will say, oh, this diet will cure prostate cancer. But in, until you, you know, put a thousand people on, you know, different diets and uh, test them over a 30 year period, you're never going to know, you know, whether it's, you know, there's so many other factors. It's a really hard area. And so there's lots of papers out there that suggest don't eat this, don't eat that. This seems to correlate, but it's not like if you eat this, you'll get prostate cancer, and if you eat that, you won't. It's always a slight increased risk or something like that. So um, this is a little schematic to try and help you to understand that. So here we've got a cell and the nucleus of a cell. So here's your cell wall. Here's the nucleus that contains all of the genes. Then you've got these pumps that sit on the surface and provide a channel for the nutrients here in red to come through into the cell. So if there were no pumps, they'd hit the little cell wall, they can't get in there. So what we know and what we've shown is that there's more of these pumps on prostate cancer cells than there are in normal cells. And also that that will then allow more nutrients to come into the cell. So if you've got lots of nutrients outside the cell due to maybe your diet, um, you'll have lots of nutrients inside the cell and what that can then lead to is lots and lots of cells and your cancer growing in your prostate. But maybe in Asia and Africa, they might still have the genetic uh, predisposition that leads to increased numbers of these pumps on the surface of the cell. But without the extra nutrients in the environment, they don't get prostate cancer. The, the cells won't grow more because there's not more nutrients inside the cell. But then if they move then to this Western diet, maybe then they will develop prostate cancer. So that was our theory behind all of our work. And I'm just going to take the next couple of minutes just to show you in brief some of the things that we've found to try and understand, number one, why are there more of these pumps? Why are they increased? Maybe we can try and intervene and stop them from being increased and that would then have an effect. Um, and then also, are there other ways that we can stop them, maybe using a drug? So here's, again, my very simple schematic. Now everyone knows about testosterone, androgens. Androgens and prostate cancer are a bad thing. We don't want them. We know that testosterone directly causes PSA to be expressed in prostate cancer cells. What we have shown, uh, so you know, when you have a cancer growing, you have testosterone leading to an increased PSA with the, the increased number of cells. Well, we have shown that one of these pumps called LAT3 is also directly increased by testosterone. So in the same way that you have PSA being increased in prostate cancer, you also have this pump being increased in prostate cancer. So therefore, when someone undergoes androgen ablation therapy, hormone ablation therapy, you get rid of your testosterone, your PSA drops, and also these pumps drop. So there seems to be a good correlation of this pump with this dip that you see after you undergo hormone ablation therapy. But what our research has shown is that the cells really want to grow, and that's a problem with cancer cells. Once they've started growing, no matter what drugs you throw at them, they always seem to want to find another way to start growing again. And so you get hormone resistant prostate cancer. And what we've shown is that this starvation, this decrease in the pumps that leads to less nutrients coming in, the cells find a way of getting around that. 
and that is that they increase another related pump called LAT1, which then takes over and is able to bring the nutrients in. So in early prostate cancer, you have one of these pumps on the surface, bringing nutrients in, causing the cells to grow. Then you undergo some therapy that gets rid of uh, these pumps, gets rid of the testosterone, and then the cell finds another way of getting around it. And in later stage hormone ablation, and also in metastasis, we find more of this pump. So our idea is to be able to try and design drugs to target LAT3 for early prostate cancer. So if you come in with a diagnosis of early prostate cancer, we can give you a drug that will target this pump and therefore starve the cancer by blocking the nutrients. Or if you come in with late stage cancer, maybe we can target this LAT1 pump and starve the metastasis. So how do we do that? Well, this is quite a difficult thing to do. These pumps they're quite small. They're about one ten thousandth the size of a human hair, the thickness of a human hair. So no microscope. We can't just look under a microscope, go, oh, that's what it looks like, take a picture of it, and then design a drug to it. Drugs are designed like keys and a lock. You've got these pumps being the lock and you want to design a key, you have to actually be able to look at it, see what it looks like. And the problem with a lot of drugs, they're designed a bit like a skeleton key. So you can put it in this lock and it unlocks it, and this one, and this one, and that's where you get all these off-target effects and side effects that you see of drugs. So if we know exactly what this pump looks like, we can design a very specific drug that can only target that one pump. Now the other great thing about these pumps is that they're on the cell surface. So if you think of this as the cell wall, this is a picture of one of these pumps, not our ones, but uh, someone else's determined. And you can see here in red I've highlighted the pore where the nutrient comes from the outside of the cell, comes through this pump, and then these, this door can shut and open to allow nutrients in or not allow them in. And so if we get a very specific idea of what this looks like, we can then design a drug that might fit quite nicely into here, but not fit into other pumps, and therefore block the nutrients from getting into the cell. And the great thing about this is this part is on the outside of the cell, and this part is on the inside of a cell, so we don't need to design drugs that can get into cells either. They can just wander around in your body, find these pumps, and therefore block them, and in essence, starve the cancer. And so that's where we're headed. Um, we've, the first uh, project was funded from uh, 2008 till this year by the PCFA. This project is funded for this year and next year by the PCFA. And so hopefully, uh, at the end of next year, we'll be a little bit closer to knowing what these pumps look like and we're also going to be able to then screen for drugs and try and design drugs that can stop the prostate cancer cells growing. Yeah. Are these uh, particular pumps just on prostate cancer or they can cells as well? So um, this LAT3 pump was originally named, when it was first found, it was called prostate cancer overexpressed gene 1 because it was found to be overexpressed in prostate cancer. So that's a good thing. It seems to be more on prostate cancer cells than on any other cell in the body. And as I said, there's a family of these LAT transporters, LAT1, 2, 3, and 4. And so what we often find is just one of them will be up in a certain cancer, but uh, LAT1 is also in breast cancer metastasis as well as prostate cancer metastasis. So we think these are common mechanisms, uh, common ways that cells use to be able to outcompete and outgrow the cells around them. So they are on normal cells, but they're much higher levels um, on prostate cancer cells. Uh, and just like a lot of the chemotherapeutics that are used target um, proteins that are in normal cells as well. But because they're at higher levels in prostate cells, then that should hopefully provide quite a specific um, drug. So that's pretty much the end. Um, I'd like to thank the PCFA, um, research awareness support. Research is at the top. I think that's really important. You think you probably think support should be at the top, uh, but I think for the future, you know, we need to come up with better ways to treat prostate cancer, and hopefully, then you will have less of a need for support because you'll all be cured, and it'll be a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, Movember is really to thank for all of the the funding for this work, and uh, here's. Uh, a few people from my work enjoying a nice party out at Movember. And uh, if you need more information, you can contact LB, who's our coordinator for all of our philanthropy. So um, yeah, thank you again for your time. And I'm happy to take any questions and explain things.
Can you explain the meaning of the word metastasis? So um, a metastasis is basically when the prostate cancer leaves the prostate and starts a secondary cancer somewhere else. So um, that's usually, you know, maybe in a bone and, and that's later stage cancer and usually that's not a good thing um, to happen. When it's contained in the prostate, you know, there's options. You can try and cut it out. When it disseminates, when it gets into the bloodstream, so uh, once it gets out of there and gets into the bloodstream, it can go to anywhere really in the body, your lungs, lymph nodes, uh, bone, uh, and, and that's usually not a good thing because it's much harder to treat when it's not localised within the prostate. What's your uh, best estimate on when a drug would be available? Yeah, so that's, that's a good question. It, it is that's, a very... You're asked that every time, aren't you? Yeah, pretty much. Whenever I give talks, which I, I try and give quite a few talks um, to support groups and, and as fundraising, um, and, and so that's always the, the question. So, you know, people get excited. Oh, you know, you're working on this. This will be a new drug. Uh, it takes a long time. Uh, it, it generally takes 10 years from when you discover the actual drug. So we haven't actually discovered a drug yet. We've discovered a potential uh, way that we can stop our prostate cancer cell growing. Then we have to find a drug that can specifically target that. Then you've got to go through um, phase one, phase two, phase three, clinical trials. All these things take time and millions and millions of dollars. So they've got to be good from the outset, but generally we say 10 years from when you discover a drug to when it will be uh, applied in the clinic. So yeah, all of the basic research, but everything that is currently coming out is something that 10 years ago was at this stage. So there's always this kind of rolling through of different ideas, different targets that we might be able to uh, even combine together. Uh, we're looking currently at using docetaxel together with some of our potential drugs to, to try and treat with multiple uh, drugs, just like they do for a lot of other cancers and a lot of other uh, diseases as well. Uh, to try and stop these, this escaping because we know when we treat with hormone ablation another pump comes up in its place. But maybe if you did a couple of things at the start and targeted the other pump then maybe that second pump wouldn't come up and you wouldn't get the metastasis or you wouldn't get the um, uh, hormone resistant cancer. How close do you work with other research institutes along the same lines? I'm talking now say in the States or in Europe. Yeah, um, so everything we do really we need to collaborate. Um, it is essential. So th this work that I've been doing um, is, is work that I've pioneered, but uh, I've worked with a lab in Vancouver uh, in Canada, um, one in uh, Queensland with Colleen Nelson's uh, group in Queensland and Grant Buchanan's group in Adelaide. So uh, it's really sort of you know, multi-country, multi-states. Uh, and each of us have our own expertise, our own techniques that we're particularly good at. I mean, as I said, I was an immunologist before, and now I'm doing cancer research. So I bring a different set of skills into that, whereas these other people are pure prostate cancer researchers who really have uh, very good tools available to them and a very good knowledge of the background of everything, whereas I've kind of come in from the side. So, yeah, it's really important for us to work with other groups. And, and pretty much we, we won't get funding if we just sort of put our hand up and say we're going to do this on our own. Uh, everyone really likes us to work with other people because it brings different angles, different ideas into your own ideas and really makes a, a much better project in the end. Are you looking for guinea pigs yet? <laughs> a few years off that, a few years off that. But uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're hopeful. It, it certainly seems in the lab um, that, uh, you know, these are promising targets, but we're, we're a while off that point. I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah, we've got plenty of offers up here. Mm.